Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 18. They want me to sing. They do that every once in a while. <laughs> I'm not going to do it for your sakes and for mine. Acts, chapter number 18. The title of the message is Learning More Perfectly. Learning More Perfectly. The text that we're going to read from divides a small group of people into two, two groups. Both of these groups have great godly desire. Both of these groups have great godly zeal. And both of these groups are being obedient to God. However, one of them has a more limited knowledge, and one of them has a more perfect knowledge. Let's read just a few verses. Acts 18, verse number 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born of Aliang. Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. The man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. I'm going to emphasize that again. Knowing only the baptism of John. Now, we're in the book of Acts. Jesus has lived, He's died, He's been crucified, He's risen again. And we're probably years past the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But all he knew was the baptism of John, verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they take him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Well, you can see right away of this small group of people who it was that had the more limited knowledge, and who it was that had the more perfect knowledge. Apollos, who was serving God, and obviously had been for as many as 8, 10, 12 years, preaching the baptism of John wherever he had gone. He had more limited knowledge, but boy, he had desire. Man, he had zeal. And he was obeying God with what he had to obey God with. And yet there was Aquila and Priscilla that had more perfect knowledge. Just a couple of thoughts about knowledge before we get uh, into the message itself. Number one, you need to know we've all got limited knowledge. I mean, there's nobody here that knows it all. Nobody here knows all there is about the Bible. Nobody knows all there is about Jesus. Nobody knows all there is about all the hidden truths of this world. We've all got limited knowledge. Not only so, but notice, even though Apollos was serving God miraculously with great dedication, God did not supernaturally give him more perfect knowledge. God didn't just unscrew the top of his crown and pour it in there. God allowed him to get more perfect knowledge the same way he allows most of us to get it. Somebody either teaches it to us. Or maybe even we've got to actually open the Bible ourselves and dig it out just like most of God's children have done. Dig out the truth that God wants us to have. And notice third, having a more limited knowledge hurt Apollos. It hurt him. Now, I'm not going to say the man's lost, but I'm going to say I can't say that he's saved. We're years past the death, burial, and resurrection now, and he doesn't even know Jesus has come. He has not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He has never heard about the death, burial, and the resurrection. He knows none of that. I'm, I'm not sure how God dealt with people during that intermediate time from the time that Jesus came and, and the world knew who He was. But I'm telling you, He was hurting because He was lacking in knowledge. He had a more limited knowledge. If I could describe the age that we're living in as anything, and I believe it would be known as this if we could live long enough, if the history could get past this point in time, I believe this would be what we would term enlightened ignorance. This is a time period when people know very, very little, and they're proud of what they don't know. I mean, this is a time when even doctors and scientists can no longer tell boys from girls. I don't know about you, but I find it hard to trust anything else they say. If you can't tell the difference between a boy and a girl, I'm just not sure I'm going to listen to anything else you've got to say. But it's not just enlightened ignorance outside the church. There's a lot of enlightened ignorance inside the church. 
The generation of believers that we have today has more access to the Word of God, to the preaching of the Word of God, to the written commentaries, to televised preaching than any other generation that's ever lived on the face of this earth. You've got it on your cell phones, you've got it on your computers, you've got it in your cars, and yet I dare say most Christians, no, 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 I don't want to say that, many Christians, many Christians could not even tell you how to be saved. They would say that they are saved, but if you ask them why, many Christians would not be able to tell you what you need to do to be born again. This is a day of enlightened ignorance. This morning for a few moments, and I say a few moments because I know I'm not going to get finished with this message. So at some point I'm just going to stop. I actually was foolish enough. I had three points. I'm not sure I'll get finished with the first point. But I want to share with you what... Bible believers believe. I'm not talking about Baptists this morning. I'm a Baptist, but I'm only a Baptist as far as the Baptists believe the Bible. If the Baptists veer away from the Bible, I won't be a Baptist because I am a Bible believer. And I want to share with you, and I, it, it might become a little short series, I don't know, probably not on Sunday morning, but it might turn into a little short series. What does the Bible teach? What do Bible believers believe? I want to share, I want to say three thoughts, but I'm just going to say it right now, one thought with you. Number one, Bible believers believe the Bible is the Word of God. Bible believers believe the Bible is the Word of God. Now, uh, at the very onset, I'm going to have to make a statement here, and I'm going to get a little technical with some of the things that I say today, but hang in there with me. I think I can help you before the day is over. Uh, Number one, I I need to point out, you can't use the Bible to prove the Bible is true. If you know anything about logic, if you know anything about debate, you know You can't use the Bible or a book to prove that a book or the Bible is true. It's illogical. It's it's just not done. You have to have a proven authority before you can use that authority as an authority. And so when I start off by saying that the Bible is the Word of God, we're taking this by faith. All right? But it doesn't matter what you believe about man's origin or man's destiny, you have to believe it by faith. Now, when I say that, somebody who's probably very well educated, and we've got some of those in our midst, somebody who's very well educated would say something, well, no, we've got science. And we can always go back to what science says. I want you to know when science talks about man's origins or man's destinies, science is only theorizing. Science has no facts. Can't have any facts. When God created man, when God created this world, when God created this cosmos, He was the only one here to witness it. It's never been replicated. It's never been duplicated. It's only happened once. And all the evidence that exists, of all the evidence that exists, not one shred of it points to anything that science is theorizing about. The truth of the matter is, if you're a scientist or if you're a Bible believer, you're going by faith. And it really all boils down to one of two choices. If you're going by what most people call science today, then you're believing that everything came from nothing. If you're a Bible believer, or at least you have room in your heart for the existence of God, then you're going by faith to say everything that is was created by a creator. But it all boils down to you're either going to have to go one way by faith or you're going to have to go the other way by faith. And I don't know about you, but I just haven't got enough faith to believe that everything came from nothing. Now, some of you young folks are still in school. And they're teaching you the theories of evolution. I want you to understand, if you push those teachers for evidence, they've got none. Now, they will cloak it in words 5, 10, 15 syllables long. But when it comes to actually put up or shut up, they won't shut up. They're going to keep talking. But they've got nothing to put up because they weren't there when it was created. It's not being duplicated. And there is no evidence at all that their theories are correct. The truth of the matter is... The Bible is the only logical, logical acceptance for where man came from and from where man's going. I want you to listen to me real carefully. To accept the Bible by faith is probably the biggest leap of faith 
God will ever ask of you. To accept the Bible by faith, that the Bible is the Word. That's probably the longest leap of faith God will ever ask for from you. And to be honest, it's not that long of a leap with all the evidence that God has tucked into history and into science and in the Word of God to prove, to strongly indicate that it's all true. But if you can bring yourself, if you're listening on Facebook or if you're listening via a recorded message or if you're here and you've struggled with whether or not science is true or the Bible is true, to believe that the Bible is the Word of God, that's probably the longest leap that God will ever ask you to take. Every other step after that that God will ask you to take will be shorter, it will be logical, and it will be mostly verified. There'll be enough evidence so that you won't really be having to take that long of a leap of faith at all. And here's the good news, the best news of all. If you can believe that the Bible is the Word of God and begin to walk that journey, take those short steps, that pathway will take you right into the presence of the Almighty God where you'll be able to have your sins forgiven and you'll be able to have a relationship with God forever. Might I encourage you, even though I'm starting out by saying you're going to have to believe this by faith, cut me some slack and at least listen to the rest of what I've got to say and open up your heart because I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what pathway you take. It's got to be a by faith pathway. So, number one, here's what we believe. We believe, Bible believers believe that the Word of God is, excuse me, the Bible is the Word of God. Well, somebody says, well, exactly what does that mean? When we call the Bible the Word of God, what are we saying? Here's what we're saying. We're saying it was divinely given and divinely preserved. That book that you hold in your hands today, or that electronic device, those words were divinely given, and they were divinely preserved. Now, I know how people's minds go. I go out and I talk to unsaved people usually every week, at least try to every week, and I run across people sometimes, and they'll make a statement like this, God couldn't do that. God could not give His words through men and it be purely and holy words. Let me tell you, if that's what you think of God, you're worshiping a God that's way too small. I'm telling you the God I worship, the God of the Bible. He's the God who created everything there is with nothing but a word. With nothing but a word. And He holds everything that He's created in place with nothing but a passive thought. He doesn't even have to focus on it. He just had a thought. Stay there. And she ain't moved yet. What's more, he knows every thought that's in every human mind that ever has lived, ever will live, or is living right now. And he knows those thoughts right now in this very instant. And he's able to do all of that without expending any energy or effort at all. I'm telling you, we just don't know how big our God is. Man tries to take God and put him in the thimble of his mind. Friend, God won't fit in the thimble of, of a mind. God's so big, there's not one part of him that will fit in the human mind. That's why we have to expand our mind and accept some things about God by faith. Because our minds just aren't big enough to comprehend how big and holy this God is. So, what does the Bible mean when the Bible describes itself as the Word of God? It means, number one, it was divinely given. By the way, the Bible says so. Now, I'm not going to ask you to turn to a lot of Bible passages with me, but if you'd like to turn to a couple, I would encourage you to go over to the book of 2 Timothy. Chapter 3. Look at verse number 16. Now, you should know this Bible. If you're a born-again believer, you should know this Bible verse. You don't have to memorize it. Now, if you did, it wouldn't break your brain. But you don't have to memorize it, but you ought to at least know where it is in the Bible. Because sure enough, some skeptic, some, some God-hater, some doubter is going to come to you and laugh at you because you believe that the Bible was divinely given. Well, yeah, you got to take some of it by faith, but listen to what the Bible says. Verse number 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. 
All Scripture is given by inspiration. That means by the breath of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That word inspired means God breathed. That means God literally breathed the words of, of, of our Bible into the ears of the holy men of God who wrote it down on a sheet of paper or on a parchment skin so that God gave to us a perfect word. The Bible that God gave to us is a perfect word. God made sure that the words that those men wrote on the parchment were the words that conveyed the thought that he wanted to be conveyed. It is a divinely given book. When I talk to people and try to express to them that God gave a perfect book, they say, well, yeah, God gave it perfect, but it was up to man to keep it. And you know how man messes everything up. To begin with, your assumption is wrong. If your assumption was right, your conclusion might be right. But God did not leave his book into the hands of human beings to be kept preserved. He gave a perfect word and then he promised to preserve a perfect word. Now, this one I want you to go with me to. Go to the book of Psalm, chapter number 12. You may be familiar with what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy, but most Christians don't know Psalm, chapter number 12. Look at just two words, excuse me, two verses. Psalm, chapter 12. Verses 6 and 7. If I were you, I'd mark these verses too. I'm telling you, in this day that we live, if you want to be able to give an answer to everybody that asks you a question, you need to know where some Bible verses are in your Bible. Look at Psalm chapter 12, verse number 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now, he's talking there about the, the perfect words that he gave. They're pure, they're perfect. Uh, like silver tried seven times, like, like, like silver and gold refined. They're perfect. But then he goes on to add another truth. Verse number seven, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God did not leave it into the hands of men to keep the perfect word that he gave perfect. God himself sovereignly, supernaturally has made sure that his perfect word has been preserved. That means all the power of God, all the power that created all that there is, all the power that will one day be uh, present before God when he judges both sinners and saints. All the power of God that's required and, and much, much more to hold all things in place. All of that power is at his disposal to make sure that his word is not perverted, is not corrupted. God has staked his own reputation that he himself will keep it preserved for Ever. And by the way, when he uses that phrase, from this generation, from this, he didn't mean starting today. Starting today, God's going to make sure that his word is preserved. That's not what he meant. What David was doing was he was writing new scripture. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and as he was writing this psalm, he knew it was inspired. He knew God was giving it to him, and he, he was indicating that God's going to do with this Scripture right here what he's done with every Scripture he's ever given. As soon as he gives it, he's going to start preserving it. 
back in the days when God spoke to Moses, the first, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, as soon as Moses spoke it to the people, the people knew it was the Word of God. And as soon as Moses found a parchment skin and started writing it down, as soon as the Word was given to Moses, God started preserving it. And once He gives His Word, He begins to preserve it. For how long? He begins to preserve it for Ever. Now, if you'll think with me for a second, and I know, I know I'm, I'm asking you to think an awful lot this morning, but if you'll think with me for just a moment, that verse right there will dispel two false notions that are running rampant through the church today. One notion is that men had to get together with their little councils and committees and put the books of the Bible that were inspired together. Men had to take and find the inspired books of the Bible and separate them from the uninspired books of the Bible and somehow put them together so that we would have a copy of our Bible. Now, if you have heard that, you're not the first one that's heard that. But I'm going to tell you that's not at all what happened. As soon as God spoke to Moses and Moses came down the hill and spoke to those people. Those people knew right then what he's speaking is right from the mouth of God. They didn't have to have a committee. Nobody had to vote on it. Nobody had to get together and haggle over it. Nobody had to put a stamp of approval on it. As soon as the man spoke it, the Spirit of God testified to them, and they knew right then and there that was the Word of God. And my friend, that's the way it happened when David wrote his Psalms. And that's the way it happened when Samuel wrote his histories. And that's the way it happened when Isaiah wrote his prophecies. And that's the way it happened when Mark wrote his gospel. And that's the way it happened when Peter wrote his epistles. As soon as those books were distributed, the people of God knew immediately this is from God. We don't need any committees. We don't need any ratifications. Now, don't get me wrong. There's been committees. There's been councils. There was the Council of Trent, somewhere around 312, somewhere around in that general time period. And a lot of people give credit to our Bible being put together by that council, hog slop. The saints of God knew what the Word of God was before those guys ever got together. To and by the way, there's been dozens, hundreds, thousands of those kind of committees. And the truth of the matter is they've been wrong a whole lot more than they've been right. God's Word has never needed anybody's verification. My friend, God's Word stands by itself. It is the inspired, infallible, holy, preserved Word of God. And if the Spirit of God is on you, my friend, you know it's the Word of God. And you also know what is not the Word of God, because the Spirit of God does not bear truth that it's the Word of God. Understand, God has put His power behind His book. He said, I I will preserve it. And that one little verse there, verse number 7, Psalm chapter number 12, it puts an end to us believing, I hope it does, that man had to get together and bind the Bible. No, 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 God took care of that. But not only so, it took care of this problem of recently found manuscripts. By recently, I'm talking over the last several hundred years. There's a movement in our churches today, and it's, it's, it's through the entire body of Jesus Christ. To be honest, our little Green Pond Baptist Church, we're considered to be strange today because we still believe the best English translation that God's ever given is the OKJV. You're considered strange and odd if you believe that because so many prominent people are saying the more recently found manuscripts are the better manuscripts. Now, would you just think with me for just a, a harebrain of a moment? I'm talking about manuscripts that were found in the 17, 18, and 1900s. They were found in the... Which means they were lost. They were lost for 15, 16, 1700 years. By the way, any, any English translation that you've got Today, you're welcome to bring anyone you want to. Won't nobody ridicule you. Won't nobody make you feel bad. But you're welcome to bring any, man, uh, any translation you want to in the English language or some other language if you can read it. You're welcome to bring it here. But every other translation after the King James translation of 1611, and this isn't just Brother Hall talking now. This is historically true. Every other English translation 
has been influenced by those recently found manuscripts. Every single one. The last English translation of the Word of God that relied on the manuscripts that the church has used ever since the day that Jesus Christ went back to heaven. The last English translation is the King James Bible. Now here's a thought. According to Psalm chapter number 12, verse number 7, God will preserve His Word to all generations forever. How could those be the better manuscripts when they were missing for 1,700 years? Now, folks, it don't take no genius to figure this thing out. How could they be the better manuscripts if God allowed them to be lost for 1,700 years? Do you realize that's over 80% of the church's history? Over 80% of the church's existence, they had no access to those manuscripts that some people today are calling the better manuscripts. I don't know if that makes your head spin or not, but it really ought to. The truth of the matter is, if those manuscripts are the preserved Word of God, then God didn't keep His Word in Psalm chapter 12, verse number 7, because there was a whole heap of generations that didn't have access to them. And if those manuscripts aren't the better manuscripts, if what we've got is the King James Bible, and if it's the better manuscripts, why do I need any other manuscripts? If what God gave me is the preserved Word of God, why would I want to risk changing anything for something that God didn't even preserve? Now, I've had a lot of folks over the years tell me, Brother Hall, I can understand better these newer manuscripts, and I get that. Well, not the manuscripts, but the newer translations. I can understand better the newer... I get that. Question, which is better? To be able to completely understand something that has error in it, or to be able to understand most of something that has no error in it? If you give me a recipe for homemade biscuits, and instead of milk... It tells me to put some WD, uh, some 10W40 in it. And instead of flour, it tells me to put cornmeal in it. But you make it so simple that even I can understand it. What's better? For me to find a recipe that might be a little bit harder for my small brain to understand and have me some biscuits I can eat? Or for me to take a recipe that I can understand without any effort at all, but it's going to kill me when I eat the first biscuit? Uh, the truth is... If I have to work a little bit to get to the truth, it's better to have a book that I have to work at to understand and know what I'm getting is true than it is to understand something real easy and be at risk of getting it wrong. I'm just saying the Bible is the Word of God, and that means two things. It means God gave it divinely. And it means God has preserved it divinely. And we believe that not because it's a cornerstone doctrine. We believe that because it is the cornerstone doctrine. You see, everything else we believe, we get out of that Bible. Everything I believe about Jesus, I get out of that Bible. Everything I believe about heaven or hell, I get out of that Bible. Everything I believe about God, everything I believe about damnation, everything I believe about the judgment, everything I believe about holiness and purity, I get out of that book. I need a book that is completely reliable. I need a book that has not been tainted or influenced by documents that God did not even allow the church to use for 1,700 years. I need a Bible that is the Word of God. God gave it pure. God gave it perfect. He promised to keep it perfect. I need that book. Now listen, I know I'm preaching on some dangerous waters here, but this, this is really just one of the fundamentals of the faith. You're not going to believe this, but this is the kind of preaching a hundred years ago every pastor did. That's right. Nowadays, we can't do this kind of preaching. We offend folks easy, and to be honest, we get over some folks' head too quick. 
But, but if you don't understand how important your Bible is, the devil won't have any problems at all snatching you off the right course. Now, I don't care what translation you use. I don't care. I have them all. I have a computer program, and I can just with a click of a button, I can read every translation, both in English and many of them in, I can't read those, foreign languages. But I, the only one I study, the only one I study is the King James, because it's the one that's been translated from the manuscripts that the church has had ever since the day the Bible was written. But I want you to understand I'm not saying there's not some things in the good old King James Bible that I don't understand, because there are. Let's face it, it's an infinite book. I've got a very finite mind. There's some things in that book I've been studying now for over 50 years. I've been a pastor called to preach for 48 years. I've been earnestly studying it for 48 years, but I've been reading it and studying it since I got saved at 16, 50 years ago. And there's things I still don't understand, but I don't expect to understand it all. It's an infinite book. i got a finite mind. But then again, God gave it in languages that as far as I know, not a person in this church can read in. If you can read in Hebrew, please introduce yourself. If you, if you understand Greek, if you understand Aramaic, you've got a higher education level than I've got. I've studied Greek a couple of years, but I don't speak it. I, I can only halfway read in it. I, I have to have a concordance to help me to do anything I do in it. So we've got a book that's infinite. We've got a book that was given to us in a language that we don't even understand. And the language that the King James was translated into is now 400 years old. Languages change. Words change their meaning over a period of time. If you don't believe that, just think back 50 years ago to what the word gay meant. I mean, the word gay used to mean happy, joyous. Now it means perverted. I'm sorry, but that's what it means. It means, it means perverted. Things change. So when you're reading your King James Bible, you're probably going to come across something that's going to be a little bit hard to understand. There's going to be a the instead of a you. Well, it shouldn't take you forever to figure that one out. I mean, but, but there's going to be some complications there. And when you see something that you don't understand, you know what that means? That means you're supposed to open up your Bible and study it. One of the reasons why I spend some time, some time, not a lot of time, but some time going back and studying some of the Greek words and some of the Hebrew words and even some of the Aramaic words is because I want to make sure that the word we're using in English still means what God gave us when He gave us the perfect Word. And sometimes it's changed a little bit. Sometimes we actually have to study. But my friend, is that too high a price to pay to get the perfect <coughs> Word of God? And could I just tell you, there's more translations out there now than you can shake a stick at. The last count I had was something like a hundred and something. I mean, a hundred and something. By the way, if you hadn't got it right after a hundred tries, just give up. You're, you're not going to get it. I don't think, I don't think you'll ever find an English translation that's better than the King James Bible. I don't even think anybody's even going to try again. Because I think everybody that even tries is going to use the more recently found, what they call superior manuscripts. And they're wrong. Because God didn't keep them. They can't be the superior manuscript. What do we believe? Bible believers. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. I knew I wouldn't get to point two. So I'll just dwell for a while longer on point one. You say, preacher, how convinced are you that the Bible is the Word of God? Listen to me real careful. I have anchored my eternal soul on the Bible being the Word of God. That's how much I believe in it. Listen, I'm not a novice. I went to college and I studied Bible. I didn't study other religions, but I have been introduced to other religions in these 48 years that I've been pastoring. I've read some about other religions. I'm not a novice. I've read what other people believe. I've talked to other people that believe it. 
I've rejected all, some of their stuff I've studied. I've laid it all aside. I am anchoring my immortal soul on the book, the Bible, being the Word of God. If I'm wrong, I'm lost. If I'm wrong, I'm lost. But if I'm right, I got heaven and all the rewards that are promised to those that believe that black back book. And friend, I think I'm in good company. And I hope you are too. Oh, I don't want to stop. So I'm going to give you one more thought. I'll shut up quick. Bible believers believe in a salvation by grace. What does that mean? That means God gave it. God, like a gift. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave. He gave. You understand how gifts work. You don't have to earn a gift. You just have to take a gift. If you decide to take the gift of salvation, you will respond to what you've heard and to what the Spirit of God does in your heart. You respond to the message with faith. You respond to the conviction with repentance. And if you respond those two ways, you'll be eternally born again. Now, some people say faith and repentance are works. They're not works. They're responses. Take your Bible, go to the book of Revelation, chapter 22. I'm, I'm, I'm promising you, I'm not going to dwell long. I'm not going to dwell long. But I was going to tell you about salvation anyway, so I might as well tell you this. Look at Revelation, chapter 22, verse number 17. Revelation 22, 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Notice anybody who will can take the water of life. And he even tells you what the cost is. It's freely given, and you take it for free. So if you want to be saved, you can be saved, but you have to take the gift. How do you take? Well, you take the gift of salvation by responding to the message you've heard with faith and to the conviction of the Holy Spirit with repentance. Tell you a story and I'll hush. One of my pastors, Dr. Lee Robertson, pastor of a mega church, Highland Park Baptist Church, that church ran five, six, seven thousand folks for Sunday school and training union. I think, I think training union was either three or five, something like that, was having a problem in his church. And he was having problems. I take it. He didn't give all the details when he told us about this. But I, I take it he was having problems with his deacons. Not all churches are blessed to have deacons and pastors that get along well. And he was having problems in that big church with his deacons. And those men bought him a brand new car. I don't know what, what kind it was. I'm sure it was a nice one. Probably a Lincoln Mercury. I mean, uh, uh, a Lincoln Continental. Uh, Probably real, real nice. brought the keys to him, went to his office and said, we bought this car for you. He said, I don't want it. He said, well, we bought it for you. He says, I don't want it. He didn't want to take that car because he felt like he was either being offered a bribe or because he thought they were trying to soothe their conscience while still stirring up trouble in the church. So he said, I don't want it. So they said, well, we're going to leave you the keys. He said, don't leave them in here. I'll throw them in the trash. So they left, they left the keys with the secretary on the way out. He never picked up the keys. Car set out in the church parking lot. They had gone and gotten the car and put it in the church parking lot. It set out in the parking lot. I don't know for how long. Weeks. Maybe months. He didn't go look at the car. He never picked up the keys. He never asked about the keys. He never inquired. He never touched that car in any shape, fashion, or form. Eventually, the men who bought the car came and got the keys, took the car back to the dealership, and got their money back. Question. Whose car was it? It was given to Dr. Lee Robertson, but he never took it. Whose car was it? Well, he didn't take it back to the dealership and get money for it. They took it back and got their money for it. It was a gift that was given, but it was never received, and so it did no good. Understand, salvation is a gift that has been given. 
the way you receive it is by believing the message of what Jesus Christ has done for you and by repenting of the conviction that the Holy Spirit brings into your heart. If you don't respond in those two ways, even though the gift has been given for you, you've rejected it and it will do you no good. Here's what we believe about salvation. It's by the grace of God, but you do have an obligation. You have to choose to take the water of life freely. I pray you'll do that today. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the privilege to preach. Lord, I, I'd rather stay here for a couple of hours and just finish, but I don't think they'd want to, so we won't. But Father, I pray that you'd help us today to understand that we need to know what we believe. And we need to know why we believe it. And we are so blessed to have a divinely given and a divinely preserved Word of God. Help us to read it, to cherish it, to base our lives and our eternity on it. If there's anybody in this place that's not trusted you as their Lord and Savior, I pray they would do so today. Speak to hearts, change lives. We ask all of this in Jesus' name.